Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for listening to this special edition of the Predictive Playbook. This is the Financial Markets Edition, where we talk about synergies and similarities between the sports betting markets and what you see on Wall Street and elsewhere around the globe. For example, we'll start the show here with uh, an analysis of Bitcoin. You may remember over the years, uh, or no, over the years, over the last couple of shows, lost my train of thought there, folks, sorry about that, that... um, what, I, what we had here was a peak, as you can see where my arrow is, uh, which was a sell signal at the top there. These numbers that are in red lines are the Fibonacci retracement levels. Um, simple Google search will pull those up for you for the definition. It's a very common occurrence. Um, Japanese candlesticks have actually been used for market evaluations, believe it or not, uh, dating back 2,000 years was used by uh, the Chinese back in the day and why they're called Japanese uh, candlesticks, I suppose. But nevertheless, what we have here is a weekly bar chart of Bitcoin and the current futures contract. Um, I never have ventured into the actual platforms of actually buying the asset. Um, Still, honestly, trying to figure out, like, how that all works. I, I get it. I understand how it works. I, I think there is definitely uh, a lot of applications that will benefit from it in years to come. Um, but I can get in and out with the futures. I can get short by shorting the contract as I can short bonds or the S&P 500 or cotton or live cattle or crude oil even, which we'll take a look at very um, soon. So you can see in the weekly here, we, we basically have been chopping around between the 61.8% retracement line, which is this one right here, and the 50% retracement line. Every time it's gotten back through that, it has failed. Most notably, three weeks ago, we looked like we were going to rally again, but um, you may remember Steve and I both said caution is the better part of valor, and sure enough, you get an inverted hammer, then you get a move down below 29,000. Fresh lows in this whole downtrend, and now this week we're having a pretty steady rally. Now, let's move to the daily and the daily bar chart. And by the way, this is just my opinions. You know, I highly recommend and encourage you to seek out um, advice from a, from a certified professional. I, I am a trader, but I am certainly not a certified professional in the field. So these are just my opinions. And um, and that's all I'm doing here. Much like I share my opinions on who's going to win tonight between the Phillies and the Marlins later on today at the, at the uh, Manny's Pub Show. And uh, now we're looking at a one-year daily chart. And you can see the big dramatic rally. You know, it basically started when uh, COVID was at its worst. And a lot of times these bottoms in all kinds of markets will occur at these specific levels where the sentiment just gets crazy bad negative uh you know you, if you would tell anybody you're you're buying something in this particular situation they would tell you that you're out of your mind you're crazy and if that ever happens to you take that as a good sign you know you want to be you want to be buying just like in the sports betting market you want to be buying low on teams you also want to be buying contrarian to the public opinion and that also includes the joes and the pros together and that was a common um saying and still is that uh, pros and joes you know the pros are the professional betters the big size wagers um, are way better than the public uh, better which is just the casual weekend uh, well gee I have a gut feeling I'll bet on the Eagles this weekend um, and there was certain truth to that but now you know with the increase in wealth in our country over the last 20 30 years you know it's not uncommon for a a public better to be able to throw 10 grand on casually um, because of their their wealth it's all relative and I can't I can't stress that enough but this is a daily one year back so let's uh, let's zoom in here at least from the peak to where we are now so now you can see there was uh, I believe this was last week's show a matter of fact we had the in, the can the hammer and you can see that here's the you know the hammer part, and here's the wick, and then this is where you would hold the hammer, and it looks like a hammer. But since then, it's been kind of chop suey, and now we're getting back to this retracement level, which is the 50% level, and and stalling. Uh, even though this is looks pretty dramatic here, there's a lot of work and a lot of overhead resistance to even get back up to here uh, in the weeks ahead. 
and I'm, I'm still very cautious on, on this. I have no position at all in it. So uh, that, unfortunately, is uh, the assessment of Bitcoin, and I'm just not certain of anything uh, going forward. I still remain cautious that this pattern that I'm seeing here that's unfolding, you can see you know, some of the Elliott Wave. If there's another tool that you can go research on your own, uh, it would, you know, it'll take months, if not years, to fully understand some of these concepts in a practical fashion where you can apply your knowledge in a smart way and uh, an astute way in the markets and also, you know, sports betting markets. But the Elliott wave was based on five waves. And uh, R.N. Elliott is the guy who came up with it. The story goes that he was sitting by the ocean and uh, just kind of relaxing and noticed that there was a pattern of five waves that would come in and they were of different sizes and they repeated. And then after the big wave of the biggest of the five waves came in, there was a few smaller ones, you know, which he then labeled ABC uh, type correction, consolidation waves, to which the five wave pattern would repeat again. And, you know, I wasn't sitting there on the beach with him, but we had to take his word for it because I can tell you that these patterns do come up quite a bit. And this is a daily bar. So you would have one, two, and this is all three. You could make this three and now we're going through an A, B, C correction. But if it's an ABC type of consolidation, then the next wave then is down. So we need to pay attention to this. There's a lot of subjectivity with Elliott Wave sometimes. There are models out there that do it automatically. Uh, I haven't found them to be uh, completely, you know, even 75% where I would agree with the count. And, uh, you know, much like card counting and blackjack, here we go. It depends on when you sit down at the table. You know, you don't know what the number is when you sit down at the table. You have to sit there for a little bit to be able to come up with where you think it might be or come up with your own and then just roll from there. Um, but the same thing with the Elliott Wave, the counts, the one, two, three, four, five, and whether it's part of a super cycle wave or just the, the basic daily waves um, is up to interpretation. It really is. But it's something worthwhile to at least familiarize yourself with moving forward. So um, let's move over to the S&P. Let's do crude oil because last week I said that crude was really starting to get frothy. And uh, sure enough, you know, we, we now have, you can see the, you know, the, the, you know, meteoric rise. I don't know what else to call it. We have the indicator now up here above the extension level. And that's basically what this horizontal line is designed to tell me. So it's like a rubber band. Imagine a rubber band stretches you know, and it stretches and stretches and stretches, and then it finally stretches like here. And then you have a little snapback, but sometimes that snapback is so great that it, it actually would hurt if it hit you. And uh, that, you know, many ways is, is what happened with Bitcoin, where everybody thought it was going to 200,000. And those people are very smart people. But the majority, when uh, sentiment gets to be so frothy and so bullish that something that's worth 60,000 is almost guaranteed to go to 200K. Those are warning signs, and you can pay attention to that just with uh, your day-to-day -day lives. You, you don't need a complex algorithm or model. You can just take a pulse of the market by listening. Um, and you know, you, you now you can go to a bar, right? This is where you'll get incredible sentiment information because somebody will, you know, be on their third pint of beer or their third whiskey and say, "Yeah, I, I own Bitcoin." You know, they wouldn't be saying that now, though, would they? You know, when it was 58000 of course, everybody and their brother owns it. Even if they didn't own it, they're going to tell you they own it. And uh, <laughs> it's just the way it is. So now we look at uh, crude here. And this pattern is, that's an engulfing candle. We had a high of 74.45, which is the contract high for the August crude oil contract. And what August means is that by the third Friday in August, actually, it's a Saturday settlement. All those contracts disappear. They either settled up for uh, you know, barrels containing a thousand gallons of crude, um, which is basically brought into the you know, New York City Harbor. But there are two different types of oil, and this will be a trivia question uh, that we're going to answer or ask Tony Finn uh, possibly later today. There's two different types: Brent and WTI. And we're going to have a lot of laughs when we hear Tony Finn 
Tell us what WTI stands for, and you'll know ahead of time because it stands for West Texas Intermediate. The Brent is the Brent North Sea, and that will have a premium over the West Texas Intermediate. The reason it's a premium is because of the travel cost to get it into a harbor, get it into a refinery where they can distill it and make it into jet fuel, unleaded gas, heating oil, and a whole bunch of other uh, products. So this engulfing candle is highly negative. It's, this is textbook with this retracement. At one point, you know, keep in mind, we had a, a, a building hammer here. But these engulfing candles, I have found you take 50% of that range. So let's say that was a $2 range. You can expect a $1 rise from the closing level of the engulfing candle the following day. And sure enough, we got that and maybe just a little bit more, which is fine. It's not, you know, this isn't a perfect science. And now we're starting to get it more into that doji pattern, which is an open and close is exactly the same. And you have equal trade on both sides, which is what this picture is telling you. And I've always said, you, the, the story is told right here in front of your eyes. And um, yeah, just like in the sports betting markets too, the story is told before your very eyes. So that is crude oil. That is becoming a short position. Um, and again, I'm emphasizing for those that are just coming on, this just my opinions, um, just offering them out there, trying to share and teach a little bit of uh, some of the things I've, I've learned over many, many years. This is heating oil. So heating oil is, is seasonal, right? You know, we use heating oil in the winter, at least here in the Northeast. Uh, you know, places, you know, Southern California may not know what heating oil is. And that's, that's okay because their weather is great and it doesn't get cold enough where they really have to turn the heat on. But again, on the same, the, the day before, we have a huge engulfing candle here. It would be a really good one if it would have taken out 219.16, which is $2.19.16 for a thousand gallons per contract. That's how much that is. So, You'll, you'll notice too in your heating oil bill, like the, the contract uh, that you have may say three dollars and forty cents, and that's the margin that they they have to to work with. And you keep in mind they have to pay for the trucks, they have to maintenance the trucks, the you know the tankers have to bring the oil to you, they have to pay the guy to actually drive the truck and put it in your tank, and those things all add up. Um, but there is a, um, and this is not an advertisement, but I just thought of it. CashHeatingOil.com. So that's cash, two H's, CashHeatingOil.com. You stick in your zip code and you'll be amazed at what you can have delivered to your home as compared to the contracts that you have with some of the other businesses that you know take care of your furnace and, and clean it up and maintenance, maintenance uh, it you know once a year. And I have found that there's plenty of people out there that are qualified and licensed to do that kind of work for you once a year without being tied to a, a cash he heating oil price. And you can save an awful lot of money by doing this. So cashheatingoil.com, I, you know, I, I get no nothing from it, but I learned it from a friend and uh, checked it out. And again, you know, that's how we improve ourselves by listening to what other people say sometimes and taking their advice and seeing if it works for you. So uh, heating oil here is doing the same thing as crude did. And then uh, lastly here, we'll look at the whole circuit. And this is the uh, unleaded gas. So it's same chart basically as crude. Obviously, unleaded gas is and heating oil are made from crude oil. There's a ratio of those three that is called the crack spread. And you can research that as well and the history of how that uh, came to be named that. So in this particular case, we already have a massive engulfing candle. And what this is telling you is that these prices had already factored in the vacation months. And now we're in August in terms of the contract that we're looking at right now. And you're going to see a steady backwardization of these contracts going into December because the demand for unleaded is going to wane because of seasonal pressures. Uh, it, it may be overextended because of uh, economic, macroeconomic uh, factors, but it, nevertheless, this is a major engulfing candle. They don't always work. You know, I've seen them like this, and all of a sudden, price will be making new highs. That's what stop losses are for. 
If you know at any time in this trade, prices would close above 229.37 there on a closing basis, that would be my signal personally that I would be out of the out of the short trade. Let's take a look at a few of the sports stocks. Look at Endeavor, which is uh, what we've been following with the UFC. And he went public back here. Um, you know, huge day. IPOs are always a lot of volatility. And you can see that there's a lot of wicks. And this is the market trying to find itself a, an equilibrium. So these candles here, this is an inverted bearish hammer. Uh, so that obviously the hammer points in the direction of, of where price is going. So yeah, price is down a little bit today. It's at 26.58. I'm not smart enough to know you could go down into here 23 or 24, but I am very bullish on the fundamentals of the UFC. Their balance sheet does have uh, a lot of debt, but so does DraftKings, and they they use that debt to support their business and support the the processes that they're building for the future. And the UFC, I think everybody would agree, is one of the fastest growing, most popular sports on the planet. Unlike uh, we saw with uh, NASCAR in the early 90s that grew meteorically, um, but didn't have this kind of um, digital technology available to it. Uh, if NASCAR had done that now, uh, we might be saying the same thing about them as we are the UFC. But I think the UFC has a much, much broader audience, global you know, you have guys, McGregor, uh, coming from across the pond. It is a global sport that really has nowhere to go but up in terms of its growth, number of viewers, pay-per-view. I mean, the whole nine yards. The fundamentals are very strong. So we're going to be looking at this in a bullish fashion and and let this uh, price movement play out. Um, another one is MGM. And uh, I, I still don't know why these white lines are coming up today, but they are. Just don't pay attention to them. But MGM now, you know, after the pandemic, here's the you know, the lows of the lows, the very, very worst days of the pandemic. And that marked the low at $14.65. Now it's up 300 and some odd percent just in this period of time, which is about uh, seven months. So not not too bad a move. This area over here is a, is a correction. You know, that's an inverted hammer. Uh, could be called a different pattern too. Uh, and I won't say what it is just to avoid confusion. But, you know, you can see there's some liquidation going on here. This is profit taking in my opinion. Unless we would really break down hard into the, the 30, you know, below 38 down in here with a big red candle with news behind it. This is just going to chop around until it sets up for the next leg higher. And again, it's a wait and see game. There's no need, in my opinion, right now to do anything. And of course, we want to look at DraftKings. So again, here's more, more of the same. We, we have a, a, a big time rally coming out of the pandemic. Sports started, right? And now we're just going through this, this consolidation. One concern is that you have these bearish divergences, all right? Peak, price goes higher, indicator does not confirm it. In other words, the indicator did not go to a higher peak. Lower peak, almost the same price as right in here, but a little bit of a failure. I would call that a failure. And now it's just kind of zigzagging. And as long as this base right here um, at 20, Let's call it 20, even 19. Uh, if that holds, then it, it, it should be okay. Um, but in terms of, of going up a ton anytime soon, I don't I don't necessarily see that on this chart yet. That uh, doesn't mean it can't happen. So um, I know there was one other I wanted to look at. Um, Comcast has been in the news too, and they, they were hit pretty hard. When the news came out, that was this. But you can see the price now is recovering. So again, there's a, a saying, buy the news, um, buy the room, buy the rumor, sell sell the fact. Okay, so you buy the rumor. When the fact comes out, you sell. So it, there's all kinds. You can use your imagination for that, but um, I'm sure you'll hear it a lot on uh, the TV networks and any other uh, financial platform. Um, and I think that was the case here. 
So uh, I'm trying to think of the one that I wanted to see. Let's just see what the S&P is doing, and then we'll call it a day. All right, so here's the S&P, and the, here's another adage for you. You know, it's all because of Tony Finn and maybe Steve Merrill. I guess it is because he, uh, you know, he definitely um, encourages it, that's for sure, and it's all in a good way. Uh, but this is the S&P 500. The adage is sell in May and go away. So that means when you get to Memorial Day weekend prior to that, um, and you can look at the patterns on the on the charts. It's 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 not a proven. It is a proven method, but I would not, you know, ad adhere to it or recommend it in any way, even in my own opinion. But it means that you sell in May and you forget the next three months. And when Labor Day is over and everybody is back to work like full time and vacation season is over, then you become active again looking for opportunity. And there's a lot to be said with that because now you can see the ranges are getting smaller and smaller. I mean, look at all these. I mean, it's just like grinding. It's like watching, um, you know, a golfer that's not a guy that's likely to shoot a 63, but he's likely to shoot one or two under, and he just grinds it out par after par after par, maybe a birdie, maybe a bogey. But um, this really is not suggesting anything at all. Uh, we did have this engulfing pattern. Went down pretty hard. We didn't have any follow through. There was a recovery. We talked about that in the previous show. Same thing with this candle. This candle should have seen a retest of the low the next day. It rallied as soon as it takes out that area. That that signal is, is neutralized and so on and so forth. And it, it tells you what to do. And it just takes a little bit of experience, I think, to uh, grab a hold of it. So we'll take one more look at Bitcoin here and then I'll... Uh, Call it a day because I have to get ready for Manny's Pub at 4 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And uh, on Thursday, it's a very special show. And uh, if my plans work out, it's going to be very enjoyable, very funny. I mean, very funny. And uh, if we can coordinate this all, because there's going to be different locations around the country involved getting into StreamYard and you know, checking in from ballparks and stuff. So it, it might be tough to pull off, but we're going to do everything we can to do it. And um, if you know anything about the show, you are going to laugh and probably laugh pretty darn hard. So uh, yeah, hope, hopefully we can pull that off and uh, Thursday at 4. But for today, I'll be back at 4. Tony Finn and Rob Vino. We also have uh, Jim Jimmy Adams coming on, who has been red hot in the... Uh, in the Major League Baseball uh, this season. And uh, I guess that's about it. So uh, for the predictive playbook, sportsmemo.com and wagertalk.com, may all the wins be yours.